good evening. evening. It's good to be back with you this evening. We continue in our preaching series through the so-called pastoral letters. I think I haven't addressed this since the time I introduced the series. Why do I always say so-called pastoral letters? Uh, The reason is because of that misunderstanding or corruption of the idea of the leadership of the church, something that we talked about this morning in our Bible class. The reason they are called the pastoral letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, is because they are held to be people that were running the churches, and that's pastors, so it's the pastoral letters. But that's just all wrong. (laughs) They were messengers and helpers endued with apostolic authority, but serving under an eldership. Because that's how the church has been organized. And the word pastor is simply the Latin translation of the Greek word poimano that we find in the New Testament, which is the word shepherd. Right? Remember, there's three words, right? The presbyteros, they are the older men, elders. There is the episcopus, episcopos. They are the ones who oversee. That's where you get the word overseer and the word bishop derives from that. And then there are the shepherds, the poimanos, which in Latin, the pastors. So pastoral series, just because that's how they're popularly known, not because we think Timothy or Titus were pastors. Clear? All right. We continue. We are studying these because of their great importance. Obviously, everything in the scripture is important, but Paul was such a powerful writer and advocate of our Lord and of the kingdom we are blessed to be a part of. And these are the three last letters of Paul in chronological order. The way they appear is the way we are studying it. We talked about 1 Timothy. We are now in Titus, and then we will turn to 2 Timothy. Um, We talked about the general themes for each one of these books. 1 Timothy, the theme is protect the doctrine. The overall theme of Titus is practice the doctrine. And the overall theme of 2 Timothy is preach the doctrine. We've done 1 Timothy, all six chapters, and read it. And now we go to the last chapter of Titus. You want to go ahead and turn to Titus, the third chapter. Titus chapter 1, our homily was the man and the mission. Talked about who Titus was, beloved son of Paul, and a mover and shaker in the book of Acts, even though he's never mentioned by name. The mission, he was left on Crete, the island of Crete, to set in order the things that were lacking. And we kind of did a preview when we did chapter 1, looking at chapter 3, where we see it was a a temporary mission, not an extended mission like Timothy in Ephesus. So the man and the mission, to set things in order. Chapter 2, we talked about the exhortations and the whys, or the reasons for their exhortations. He was commanded to give exhortations to the older men, to the older women, to the younger women, to the younger men. He was to give exhortations to himself. He was to give exhortations to bondservants and and all who would be Christians. And now, chapter 3. And our homily is very similar to another one we've had. There are things to affirm and there are things to avoid. And then he will close the letter. So, things to affirm, verses 1 through 8. Verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Remind them to be subject and to obey the rulers and authorities. Now, there is debate among commentators and among others Who are the rulers and authorities 
they are to subject themselves to and to obey. Because there are times in the letters, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in Hebrews chapter 13, where Christians are commanded to subject themselves and obey the eldership, our spiritual leaders. But there are also times when Paul wrote about the fact that we have to subject ourselves and obey the secular authorities. Think of Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Think of 1 Peter chapter 2, the end of that chapter. So which is it? Are these religious or secular leaders and authorities? And I say, yes. I think it's aimed at the secular authorities and rulers, but it applies to both. Remember, we are to be subject. And, well, let's go ahead and go there because it's one of those that always punched me right in the gut. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 13. 1 Peter 2 and verse 13. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to governors. Okay, every ordinance, what does that mean? That means we must obey the ammunition that, no, not that kind of ordinance. It means every law and every statute. Well, I wonder what that could mean, brethren. What could that mean? Surely that has nothing to do with the ridiculous speed limit on Franklin here by the church because, or crossing that bridge or beyond the bridge where you've got a cemetery on one side. Why am I not doing 45 miles an hour here? Well, there's this white sign that says 25. Well, that's ridiculous. Submit yourself to every ordinance. I wonder what that could mean. Brethren, I don't like that command of our Lord's. When I lived in New York, shortly after getting there, there was a July 4th event. And the brethren said, you got to come over, we're going to set off fireworks. And I said, no you're not. Why not? Because we live in a pathetic generation that, let me take that back, <clears throat> because they're illegal. Unless you're talking about getting the whole church together to do a bunch of worms or run around with sprinkler, sprinklers, sparklers. What are we doing? No, I got some stuff from Tennessee. Well, submit yourself to every ordinance. Well, that's ridiculous, Rick. I agree. Brethren, why can't I buy lawn jarts? Did anybody here grow up playing with lawn jarts? Did anybody here somehow hurt yourself with lawn? Well, I guess I shouldn't. You could hurt yourself, especially some of the ways we used to play. But every ordinance. Notice we're not to subject ourselves to every ordinance that we agree with. So here's where the funny becomes real. If Jesus is our Lord, we subject ourselves. And if not, not. I'm preaching hard to Rick right now. Not Rick Weaver, Rick McCurdy. Though, I guess good for him too. Subject yourself to the rulers is what Titus was to remind them to do. It's difficult. The to be ready for every good work, not sure if that's tied together with the rulers or authorities or the next verse. I think it's tied to the next verse. In verse 2, he is to remind them, the brethren, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable gentle, showing all humility to all men. So the first thing is they are to subject themselves to the authorities. The second thing is they are to practice the Christian character. And what is that? Spelled out right there. Ready for every good work, speaking evil of no one, being peaceable, remember, as much as in you, live peaceably with all men, gentle, Showing all humility to all men. Kind of a, just a condensed version of Romans 12, 9 and following. So 
the things that he is to affirm, to, to preach and teach and reinforce is subject yourself to the authority and be Christian. Act like a Christian. What's the overall theme of this book? Practice this doctrine. Don't just know it. Verses 3 through 8, the why. There's two exhortations. Submit yourself to all the governing authorities. Why? They're a bunch of wahoos. He's going to give the why now. Why should I try to be peaceable when people are trying to be so aggressive with me and have such enmity? Here's the why. And brethren, I appreciate the Bible always telling us the whys. Because I ask why. Okay? I want to know. Because I don't like it. It's not my natural instinct. Why would I do this? It's going to be hard for me to do that. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's who we used to be. But look what God did. Verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That's what He did. We we were disobedient, foolish, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful people hating one another. And that is what God did for us. Hopefully it reminds you of that Romans passage of who we are, who we were, and yet look what God did. He says, the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Do you remember back in chapter 2? For the grace of God that brings salvation has what? Has appeared to all men. Teaching us how to access that grace of God. What else did he do? He saved us through the washing of regeneration. Certainly after this morning's sermon, hopefully we understand what that is talking about. We are washed. Our sins washed away in baptism, and we are regenerated, right? There was an old man, but now it's a new man, born again, born from above. And by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, maybe better by saying the renewing by the Holy Spirit. It's not like the Holy Spirit was run down and they had to renew him, right? We have been renewed by the Holy Spirit, then why does this say whom we've received? Well, because we couldn't be with the Holy Spirit when we were in our sin, but through that washing of regeneration, now we're able to have fellowship with God and the Holy Spirit. So we're able to receive Him. And we are truly refreshed and renewed. Also that concept of the renewing of the Holy Spirit Hold your place there and turn to Colossians. Chapter 3. The renewing of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 10. We don't have the old man anymore. Chapter 3 and verse 10 of Colossians. We have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge. Who gave us this knowledge? We have it by way of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Same message, all from the same author. Beginning in verse 22, so that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, which he just talked about who we were in verse 3. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It all ties together. That regeneration, that washing, that renewal by the Holy Spirit. That's what God did for us. 
now who are we? Verses 7 and 8. So that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Brethren, just camp out there for a while and enjoy that. Who are we? We are the justified. We are the heirs of God, right? Beginning in Romans 8, and verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. And if we are the sons of God, then we are heirs. And if heirs, then joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. And not just that. Heirs inherit. And what do we have? Our hope, biblical hope, of eternal life. The difference again, hope, worldly hope is I wish. Biblical hope is earnest expectation from a God who cannot lie. Verse 8, what else are we? This is the faithful saying and these things I want you to affirm constantly so that those who believe in God, that's us, should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. We have been washed, regenerated, renewed, justified, made heirs, so that's adoption, with that hope, which is surety of eternal life if we do our part. And what's our part? Maintaining good work. Because these things are good and profitable to men. I've shared this before and I will continue to share it with you. Good works are things that we do for other people that are good. I guess that's how words work. But they're also really good for us. If I go out of my way, case in point, Thursday, I'm going to drive to McCoy for some reason. Never been to McCoy, at least not on purpose. But I'm going to drive to McCoy and I'm going to hurt my back and probably hurt my left big toe moving a bunch of stuff. Why am I doing that? Well, because I'm going to help a brother and sister out. And that's a good work. But you know what I'm not going to be doing Thursday morning while I'm doing that? I'm not going to be sitting around wondering and worrying about, oh, poor little Rick, and all the things poor little Rick has to deal with, and oh, boo-hoo this and boo-hoo that. Why? Because I'm about the good works of the Lord. And I become free. And as our Lord said in another context, but it applies, truly it is more blessed to give than to receive. Good works. These things are good and they are profitable to men. Not just the one receiving, but the one doing. The more we're like our Lord, the better. And that's the charge there in verse 8. This is a faithful saying. The, I was going to mention, remember that sermon? But I've written it, but I haven't given it yet, so... Never mind. Um, it's coming in a week or two. But uh, this is a faithful saying. These things I want you to affirm constantly. Just keep reminding them of this. Brethren, this is what we're supposed to do with each other. As iron sharpens iron, we're supposed to be doing this. Affirming the truth, the gospel message. Shining the Christian character and encouraging and admonishing the Christian character in others. And back and forth and that synergy makes us shine and it is good and it is profitable. Things to affirm. Now, things to avoid. Verses 9 through 11. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. In contrast to the good works, which are profitable, these things are unprofitable. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped, the New King James says, and sinning being self-condemned. What is that self-condemned? His actions and his words are condemning. They are showing his corruption. So, things to affirm we talked about. What things are we to be avoiding? Disputes and the people that cause them. Compare what we just read about these disputes. 
genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. Paul warned Timothy, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause, oh, disputes, rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, disputes. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. There's that same word. Look at verse, verses 19 and 20. You, Timothy, have faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Turn to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, the first three verses. Sad words there in verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Turn to Titus chapter 1. Well, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, and on and on and on. Turn to Titus chapter 1, verses 10, 11, and 14. Why was Titus to make sure and install an eldership of qualified men? For there are many insubordinate, they do not subject themselves, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who like probably to talk about genealogies, right? Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Verse 14, nor giving heed to Jewish fables, commandments of men, who turn from the truth. All of that. Those are the disputes. Stay away from all of that. Turn away from it. It's not profitable. Getting into the mire to wrestle with the pig is going to make you look like a pig. Right? What's the problem with arguing with a fool? Third party can't tell which is which. Avoid these disputes. And avoid the people that cause them. But we don't just avoid them saying, I'm not going to deal with them. They are to be dealt with. Look back at chapter 3 and verse 10. Reject a divisive man. That's a man who is causing division in the church. Reject a divisive man after the first and second Admonition. What did our Lord teach in Matthew 18, 15 through 17? If your brother sins against you, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go to him, try to make it right. If he doesn't listen, you're supposed to go with two or three others. Try to make it right. And if that doesn't work, then he's turned over. If one goes into the church, he's gone. Same thing here. Apparently, Paul was a big fan of baseball. Three strikes, and you're out. So we address divisive men. We address those disputes, but we don't become embroiled in them. We don't let them dominate. Dominate. I don't know if it happens so much here, but I'm sure you have seen places where in Bible studies it turns into a battle between people who have personal agendas. You're going to deal with this, so get ready. Someone's got a hobby horse that they want to ride, and they're going to try to make that point. 
every time they have an opportunity to speak. You need to put an end to that. Let's talk about that another time. Here's what you do. Let's talk about that after class. I'd love to spend some time with you because you don't want to waste the time of everybody else. And then you deal with it. And then you deal with it. And if he won't hear the truth, then you have to reject that person. What's to be avoided? Division. Things that aren't profitable. Why would we waste our time? And the people that lead us that way. Finally, Closing the letter, verses 12 through 15. Verses 12 and 13, he gives him directives and details. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. So, He's going to be uh, um, tag-teamed out by either, either Artemis or Tychicus, okay? And then he's going to go to Paul. Paul says he's residing in Nicopolis. Which Nicopolis? Um, in the Greek, it would probably be pronounced Nik, Nikaopolis. Because do you remember what Nika means? Nike, if you're wearing... These aren't Nikes, obviously, but... Um, the Nike shoe brand, it stands for victory, the goddess of victory. So there were lots of towns named Nicopolis, just like there are lots of towns called Alexandria. But the one that he's probably talking about, this is a map showing Paul's missionary journeys, he's probably talking about this Nicopolis right here, central western Greece, okay? There's Achaia, there's Macedonia. That was the site of the great naval battle of Actium, where the forces of Augustus utterly defeated the forces of Antony and Cleopatra. That's probably where he's referring. That was a big deal at the time. So Paul says, I'm going to winter him or here. Titus is down here in Crete. Come see me when I send Artemis to you or when I send Tychicus. And and if he liked to be called Tychicus, that's fine with him, but he, he should have told the Greek language because there's no ch in, the, in that language, so deal with that. Um, so directives and details. The other directives, send Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. So these two gentlemen probably brought this letter to Crete to Titus, and he's being told, help them on their way wherever they're going. Give them funds or food or whatever they need to go on their missions. And then the last two verses, verses 14 and 15, he finishes by giving Titus another charge and then a little cheer. Verse 14, and let our people also learn to maintain good works. He just said, send these two gentlemen off, help them. And then he refers to good works because what would be the helping of these missionaries? be a good work. Help them to learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Wonderful, beautiful words. Because why I put the, the charge and the, the cheer, verse, four is a, or verse 14 is another Teach them this. Affirm this. And then verse 15 is, you're not alone. We're not alone. Not only are we with the Lord, but there are brethren, and the brethren all greet you. Therefore, Titus 3, very similar to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 2, the sad reality is there will be false teachers bringing false doctrine. And we need to be forewarned because that is forearmed. Maybe the main message for us today is there are always things for Christians to be avoiding while we as Christians are always pursuing. Christianity is not a negative religion. 
Oh, Christianity is nothing but you shall not, thou shalt not, don't do this, don't do that. Those things exist, but the reason those things exist is because there are things we are supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be shining light and taking this message to the world. And if we're liars, the world won't listen to us. So he says, don't lie. Because otherwise you can't do the work. Don't be a bad, rascally kind of person because no one's going to want to hear from you. You're blaspheming the word of God, not adorning it. There are things we are to avoid, the things of the evil of this world, the, the corruption that seeks in. And, and maybe, maybe the most insidious is the I'm okay, you're okay. The lackadaisical approach to what's going on. Um, Deirdre made a statement that, I mean, I've heard a billion times, but she said it in a study we had a couple days ago. And all she said was, every person has an appointment with eternity. You've heard that before, right? Every person has an appointment with eternity. Okay, yeah, I know that. No, think about that. Every person in the world, let's narrow the scope. Every person in Christiansburg is going to stand before God and have to give an answer. And the result is going to be everlasting life or everlasting condemnation and punishment. Is this the population of Christiansburg I'm looking at right now? No. Well, then how is that going? It is not going well for so many. So let us not be satisfied with our own salvation, but think about what it really is all about. I'm not saying you've got to go get a, you know, a sandwich board and be out on the corner. That's probably not going to be profitable. It would be really cool today. But I'm saying every interaction we have with someone else, we might be the only chance they have to see and hear Jesus. Take advantage of it. Pursue that and reject me sitting in front of the TV for 45 minutes, not watching anything because there's nothing on. Well, then, then why are you sitting there? Because doing nothing is easier than doing something. Reject that, pursue that. There is one more thing, sorry. Don't miss the major theme of Titus, which is good works. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess to know God, but the works they deny Him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every, what? Good work. Chapter 2 and verse 7. In all things, Titus, show yourself to be a pattern of good works. Verse 14. Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying. These are things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Verse 14, and let our people also learn to maintain good works. Do you hear it? That's why the prophet of reading the gospel to yourself aloud, because you'll hear this. I've never heard him speak so much about good works before. It's the main theme here. Why? What's the overarching theme? Practice the doctrine. How do we practice the doctrine? One way is good works. Don't just know the doctrine. Don't just believe the doctrine. Don't just love the doctrine. Practice it. Adorn it with your life. And share it with the world. Chapter 3. Next week, we review and we read. If you're not a Christian this evening, God calls to you from this precious book with this good news that his son came and died that you might live. If you've never taken him up on that offer of everlasting life, why not this evening? Christians, good works. Stimulate together. We come together to, to stimulate one another to good works. Let's never stop remembering who we are 
make sure we're about the things we need to be. Shining, not covering our, our light. Interacting, not hiding ourselves away. But living that Christian life and speaking those Christian words. If you haven't been doing that, if you haven't been walking in the light or speaking it, come forward. Let us help you as together we stand and sing. No longer.